Hello everyone, how's it going? We are nearing the much anticipated 1.29 update on EU4. And today, I wanted to take a quick look at what changes are coming to the game and what we can expect. If you haven't read the dev diaries or just haven't followed the updates, a new EU4 patch is coming out in a couple of days, which will make some changes to the game in East Asia primarily. The patch will also have updates for 64-bit support, which might mean some minor performance uptick for some players. So let's jump right into it and see what changes are coming. First and foremost is the change to the mandate mechanic. The mandate is something that has been used by players to take Ming down. But if Ming is left alone, you rarely see a Ming plosion in the current patch. In fact, Ming rarely expands aggressively and they don't explode, which means a fairly stable East Asia most of the time. Which is something we don't really want to see in-game. It's always more fun to see dynamic changing borders, new tags, and unlikely superpowers. In 1.29, Mandate will not drop when bordering non-tributaries, which is a fundamental change on both how to take down Ming and how to play Ming as a player. Mandate will still tick up when you have tributaries, so there is still the need to acquire tributaries. But now, just bordering an AI Ming won't make any difference. Also, as a player now, you don't need to keep a wall of tributaries between you and a big nation. And if you can keep your mandate high, now it will give you some war exhaustion reduction, which is a very nice perk, and will definitely help with rapid expansion. So what will cause the mandate to go down now? One is loans. Now for every 5 loans, mandate will go down by 0.03, and bankruptcy will cause a loss of 0.05 mandate per month. In my opinion, that seems rather low, I mean bankruptcy should cause more severe mandate loss. But anyways, now the strategy to take Ming down will be to force them to take more loans. Mandate will also go down by 0.05 for every 5 corruption. So that's something to keep in mind for players, especially in late game. The Empire will also lose Mandate when they don't control the provinces of Beijing, Nanjing and Canton. So that's another strategy to take Ming down, snag those provinces in a war, then sit back and watch the Ming plosion happen. Another change is to the unguarded frontier disaster, which currently counts only the development of the Horde Nation. In 1.29, it will also count the development of the Horde Nation's subjects. For players who don't know about this disaster, one of the triggered requirements is for Emperor of China to border a Horde Nation with at least 300 dev. So in the new update, playing as a Horde, you can now have vassals and march and have a combined dev of 300 to start the disaster which is nice, and again, targeted towards causing easier Ming plosion. Another change is to meritocracy, which the dev diary says decay has increased to minus 2. Isn't it already that? A base decay of minus 2 per year? I'm not sure what the change there is, but I guess we'll see when the update comes out. Low meritocracy will now also increase corruption, again, something that can potentially drain your mandate. And high meritocracy will decrease corruption, which is super strong late game, when you're dealing with corruption from too many territories. Especially since by late game, you have harmonized most of the religions, so there is no significant drain to meritocracy. I think Ming in player hands now is even stronger. But I cannot see AI Ming being able to hold on to Mandate all game. And once the Mandate is down, these are the current modifiers which are already pretty bad. But in 1.29 update, it gets worse. Now the available Mercs modifier is minus 200%, so Ming cannot hire Mercs at zero Mandate. And they get a minus 50% manpower modifier as well. Considering the low supply in most of Ming provinces, AI Ming is just going to lose like half of their army crossing the country. So at zero mandate, Ming is done. Even as players, it would be a colossal task to survive at zero mandate. You will now also gain mandate while using the Unite China CB and a new emperor will generate extra mandate for the first 20 years. But the biggest change is for new empires that have seized the mandate. In the current patch, seizing the mandate for yourself is never advised because you suffer from all the malices of having low mandate. But in the new patch, a nation who has just seized the mandate starts with 60 mandate and 60 meritocracy. This is a big change and will allow players to seize the mandate from Ming and quickly stabilize their nation. Definitely something you can do now with Qing or Yuan if you are so inclined. There are a couple of new events and disasters as well. 
Crisis of Ming Dynasty is a new disaster that can fire if Ming has low mandate after the Age of Discovery. As I understand, this disaster only applies to the Ming tag. Once the disaster fires, Ming gets penalties to morale, tech cost, and unrest, along with stab hit, mandate hit, and corruption. There will also be peasant rebels, and if the peasants occupy 10 or more provinces in a region, new breakaway tags will spawn, commencing the start of Ming Plosion. In South China, there will be individual armies and Ming will get an option to accept their independence or go to war, while in North China, Shun Tag will spawn and go to war against Ming. This seems like a really bad disaster and definitely something a player can trigger against AI Ming fairly easily. The new big event is the Tumu Crisis with Oirat. If Oirat is disloyal and refuses to pay the tribute, Ming Emperor becomes a leader and leads an army to fight the Oirat. Now if Oirat defeats that army and event fires, giving Oirat combat and siege bonuses, and giving Ming stab hit and low mandate and a regency council. Then if Oirat can siege down Beijing quickly, they will automatically occupy every province in the North China region. Obviously this would mean a big war score where you can take a lot of provinces and start the eventual Ming plosion. Now if all the things you heard till now sound to you like it would cause Ming to explode, that's precisely the idea. All the changes that we see in 1.29 are made to make AI Ming significantly weaker while still keeping Ming a strong option to play as a player. The devs said that in their playtesting, AI Ming collapsed about 3 out of 4 times. And I can assure you, if you start as one of the Manchurian tribes or Oirat, you can guarantee Ming Plosion fairly easily. I personally think it's a great change and I'm looking forward to playing in that region. Basically you can destroy Ming in one war now, make them take loans and cause devastation tanking their mandate, and AI Ming will never recover. Better even if you go to the war after Age of Discovery and can cause the disaster to fire. And even as a player, you will have to be careful when passing Celestial Reforms, as your mandate will drop and you'll have to time it very carefully. There are also changes to the Manchuria region in this patch. We have some new tags now, and requirements to form Manchu has changed, as now you need 20 core provinces of Jurkin or Manchu culture. While the biggest change here is that Manchu is in the Chinese culture group now, which makes playing as Manchu and expanding in China even easier. Also, the Jurkin tribes, Manchu and Qing have unique mission trees. Mongolia also has seen some changes with more provinces and more development, along with a brand new mission tree which honestly looks rather strong. Restoring Great Yuan seems easier now and you get a lot of permanent claims to keep expanding towards the old empire of Genghis Khan. We will look at the mission tree details when the update is out. Also notice here the lack of Bariyati attack. It seems that tag is gone now along with the fabled gold mine there. Bariyatia is now a revolter tag instead which means you might still see it if rebels are successful. The banners have seen a nerf too. Well, sort of. There was certainly an attempt to nerf them. As the bonus discipline now have been decreased from 10 to 5, they also reinforce half as fast and now there are less banners per development. Seems like a nerf definitely. But now they only use 25% of manpower, which means one banner regiment will only use 250 manpower and they are 50% cheaper in maintenance. I mean that is huge. Once you have enough dev in your nation, you will want to keep standing banner armies around all the time. They are super cheap now. So overall, I think banners are only very slightly nerfed in the new patch. There are a couple of additional new tags. Tung Ning can now form in Taiwan when Ming is busy fighting for their life. A new Japanese daimyo tag who is a pirate. That's right, a pirate daimyo tag which can form after Wokou incident. Definitely one worth looking into. I can imagine playing as that pirate tag and harassing Ming with trade dispute CB contributing even more to the inevitable Ming plosion. Japan has a new mission tree now, and it's shared by Daimyo, Shogun, and Japan. It's basically a gated tree where new branches unlock once you become a Shogun and later form Japan. Korea has also seen some changes. They also have a new mission tree now. While I think Korea is now even easier to play with the new tags to the north where you can expand easily, and as Ming will explode most of the time, you can expand in China as well. 
However, the mission tree doesn't seem particularly expansionist, and now Korea has more events related to internal strifes with Peasants War and Estate Purchase. Those events will be related to the mission tree as well. And again, we will learn more about mission trees once the update is out, as the dev diaries don't explain everything. Then there's the PDX launcher now in EU4, similar to Imperator Rome, make of that what you will. And there's a new feature in Nation Selection screen which will give you information on which DLC adds flavor to that particular nation, which I think is a great feature. They might do a limited rollout for that feature, we'll see about it when the update comes out. And finally we have some new idea sets. Let's look at them and compare them to the old ideas. Currently, the Jurgen tribes Manchu and Qing have the same ideas. But with the new update, there are separate ideas for Jurkan tribes, for Manchu and for Qing. And basically, the ideas get better as you go from Jurkan to Manchu to Qing. Here are the old and new Manchu ideas. The difference is that old was 10% manpower and minus 20% CCR, while the new is 15% manpower and minus 15% CCR. The global tech cost reduction now is only 10% military tech cost reduction. Also the manpower recovery and unrest modifiers are gone, replaced by A reduction and institution spread, which is a clear nerf. And basically, it encourages players to form Ching and take those superior ideas. Also, you don't get the extra land leader shock as finisher anymore. Instead, you get 15% extra morale, which is actually really good. Overall, Manchu ideas are slightly nerfed, but the brand new Ching ideas more than make up for it. 20% CCR and 10% AE reduction to start, 30% more banners, 15% manpower and manpower recovery speed, minus 2 unrest, minus 5 years of separatism, plus 1 meritocracy for when you get the mandate, plus 5 admin efficiency, autonomy change morale and advisor costs. Those are some really good ideas. It's now on par with Yuan ideas I think. So you'll definitely want to form Ching in this game. And here are the Jerkan ideas for comparison. Like I said, the ideas get stronger as you form Manchu and then you form Ching, which is a fairly good progression I must say. Now we also have new idea sets for Oirat, Mongolia and Chagatai. In the current patch, these nations just have generic horde ideas, which are fairly strong in themselves, but having separate idea set for nations is also nice. So let's start with Oirat. Oirat starts with 20% CCR, which is good, but also less than the previous 25% CCR you get later in game as hordes, but that's compensated by 15% AE reduction compared to 10% earlier, and tech cost reduction and discipline as well. So overall, Oirat ideas are significantly better than generic horde ideas. Mongol ideas on the other hand are similar and sort of a mix between Oirat and the generic horde ideas. I do like the 10% movement speed though, and you get the 25% CCR later in game. Chagatai on the other hand has an interesting set of ideas with 20% harsh treatment cost reduction, 25% CCR and 15% Diplo Annex cost reduction. Definitely something you can carry into late game. Although you will want to form Yuan eventually, I think Chagatai is something you can definitely play as late game with those ideas. We also have new ideas set for Shun, as we might see that tag more often now. Earlier they had the generic Chinese ideas, now they have a slightly better idea set. The extra mandate and meritocracy will help when Shun takes a mandate. Other than that, it's a fairly average idea set. And then you have a separate idea set for So, which is the tag that forms the Daimyo Pirate Nation. So obviously it's trade and naval focused, fairly standard. And the new Evenki culture tags will have the Evenki ideas, which are also decent, but you will almost always go to the Manchu Ching route from there, so they are not super important here. And so those are the changes coming in the 1.29 update. In my opinion, they seem great, especially considering it's a free update. Ming Plosion will happen more often in games now, and I'm definitely going to try some of the Eastern tags over the next month or so. Although it's not clear which new changes are tied to the Mandate of Heaven DLC right now. I guess we will have to see when the update comes out on the 17th. We will also look at the new mission trees then. And that is all for now. You were watching a Radiators video. Thank you for your time and I'll see you all in the next one.